Welcome, and it's lovely to see you. Uh, you're all welcome in Christ's name. Uh, we meet together, worshipping God, praising him. Uh, we also welcome those who join us on live stream. It's really good that each week there's some who do that, so we welcome them too. Uh, and we welcome Jim Spencer. Jim preaches here uh, fairly regularly through the year, different times, so it's great, Jim, to share fellowship with you again also. And then we'll have a gathering at the Lord's table uh, afterwards, all who truly love the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in him for their salvation uh, are most welcome uh, to join and take part at the communion table. Uh, and then we have lunches together, those of us who worship here regularly uh, bring our lunch. And then we have another time of Bible study at about one o'clock. So we do our Sunday from 10.30 till about 2 and uh, worship together. Uh, and then on Wednesday, uh, prayer and Bible study uh, here at uh, 2 o'clock. Uh, we'll be continuing that little series that we started in Romans 7 and 8. Uh, so that's uh, Wednesday. Uh, and then next Sunday, God willing, our friend Mike McGill uh, will be preaching here uh, in the morning. Uh, let me remind you as well, there's lots of literature on the table and uh, stuff to take, so do help yourself to whatever you'd like to. Thanks. Yes, uh, <clears throat> good morning to everybody. It's lovely to, to see, uh, well, a full house, um, and, uh, and I'm sure it's not because I'm here, that's for certain. Um, and it's lovely to see the children here as well. I can tell you I'm an I'm a, 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 a itinerant preacher, and I go to so many small rural chapels around East Anglia, and very rarely do I get asked to do a children's talk. So uh, it's the hardest talk to give, I can tell you, but it's, uh, it's a pleasure and a delight to have children to speak to. So we're going to just ask the Lord to bless us. So let's pray for a moment. Our dear Father in heaven, we thank you for bringing each one of us here this morning. We thank you that we can come before you in prayer and ask for your help, ask for understanding. Lord, ask for your presence. What a wonderful thing to think of, that we are meeting with the living God, the great creator of the universe. And uh, Father, all around the world, we know that uh, millions are bowing their heads and their hearts to you and Father, we want to sing our praises to you. So bless us with your presence. Help each one of us to enjoy the hymns and uh, the prayers, the reading. Oh, Father, may we just enjoy our presence with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our first hymn, 41. Come, thou almighty King, help us thy name to sing.
to the children. <coughs> now you might need some help um, from uh, the parents. That's something that makes parents shudder sometimes. Oh no, don't ask me. Um, <coughs> This is going back a few years, so I'm, I, I shall be quite surprised if any children can tell me what this word means or, or how you even say it. Have a look and see. That's a word and a half, isn't it? Some adults know what it is, but uh, any children know what it is? Whew. I'm so pleased. I'd be astounded if you did. Well, you actually say the word WYSIWYG. That's not bad, is it? But what does it mean? Well, what it means is what you see is what you get. <clears throat> it's an old computer term that they used to say years ago when computers were manufactured by Mr. Sinclair and uh, they went <coughs> as they took 20 minutes to load up. <clears throat> Now, some people have used this term about themselves. They'll say, well, what you see is what you get. And they'll say that about themselves. But I don't think you can say that about people. You know, on Sunday, we all look pretty presentable. I mean, I know I am, but it's my wife dresses me and checks that I'm colour coordinated and uh, all of that stuff. Um, and I could say, well, what you see is... But you wouldn't see me like this on a Monday morning, I don't think. Probably not with a jacket on, anyway. Um, so what you see is what you get cannot be said, really, about people. We all have uh, an inner thing going on. We don't, we don't let everybody know our thoughts, probably just as well. When it comes to men and women, boys and girls, what you see is not what you get because none of us displays the true us. No. When things go wrong, <clears throat> when things don't go our way, what you see is not what you get with me. My grandchildren call me Mr. Grumpy sometimes. <clears throat> and I can get grumpy over the most silly little things. Generally, where I live, which is in Suffolk, <coughs> um, to get to the town, I have to do a, a, a cross a railway line. And if I'm in a hurry, the gates are always down. Now, those gates wind me up. I mean, it's ridiculous. I have heard myself, I mean, you'll find this hard to believe, I've heard myself shout at the gates from in the car. It's ridiculous. And uh, when I'm doing some... Uh, Building work, I used to do that a little bit when I was sort of doing my own house up a bit. Um, if things didn't go right, well, I wasn't always the nicest person to be around. So despite our polished exterior, even the man who sits or stands up in the pulpit, what you see is not always what you get. You see, the Bible tells us the heart is deceitful above all things. Desperately wicked. Who can know it? We read in Jeremiah. Well, there is only one who can know our heart. Only one. One who can truly know everything about us. The good, the bad, and the ugly. You see, God knows us better than we know ourselves. And the good news is, even though God knows us so well and knows when we're Mr. Grumpy or knows when we've done wrong, God still loves us. Isn't that amazing? God loved you enough to send his only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you. If you would have him, if you would have Jesus as your saviour, God loves you. And that is the one person that WYSIWYG can be applied to. And that's what you've ever heard Jesus Christ <laughs> termed as WYSIWYG. But what you see is what you get with Jesus. Absolute perfect 
human God man. Absolute perfect, without sin. That's why we can say to people, in Christ you're saved. Not of yourself, but in Christ. That's why we, we daren't say to people of other religions, oh no, you're okay, all roads lead to God. No, it's all of Christ. And salvation is as simple and as straightforward as just asking Jesus. Ask Jesus to come into your life, to be your saviour. And all of your Mr Grumpy, Mrs Grumpy, all of your messed up sinful life is given over to Christ. None of us are perfect, none of us will be perfect in this life. But one day we will, because we will be clothed in his righteousness. And that's the great thing about doing a children's talk is actually age is no barrier. No matter how young you are, you can have Jesus Christ as your saviour now, right today. You can have Christ as your saviour. Age is no barrier for the young. And there's no barrier for anybody here who's maybe advanced in years and you've never really had a personal relationship with Jesus. What's stopping you? Have your sins forgiven. Amen. So, I don't expect you'll ever come across that word WYSIWYG again now. It's old-fashioned, out of date. But uh, maybe you'll think of it sometime. And, but most of all, think of Jesus and have him as your saviour. Let's just have a prayer for the children. Our dear Father, we do pray for the children. We know that this is a, a very sinful world, a very fractured world, a very violent world. Father, we pray for our next generation. We pray for the youngsters here. Lord, above all, would they know that Jesus is their saviour? Personally, have Jesus as their Lord and saviour. For all of us, may we invite Jesus here and know the wonder and the loveliness of having our sins forgiven. We ask it in his most glorious name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to have our second hymn, which is 518. In loving kindness Jesus came, my soul in mercy to reclaim, and from the depths of sin and shame, through grace, that is through love, he lifted me.
he will come up and uh, read God's word to us. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, commencing at verse 18 through to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. <coughs> if, you're, uh, if you're reading from the Blue Bible, the, the Church Bible, we're on play, uh, page 952 in the Blue Bibles. And this passage is headed, Christ, the wisdom and power of God. <coughs> For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Do not many of you, consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards, not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Mm. It's God's word. Thank you, Ralph. <clears throat> and now I'll ask John if he would come up and uh, pray for us, John. Thank you. pray together. Most holy God, we bow in your presence, we hear your word, uh, we reflect, Lord, on what we know of you and we praise you for your great name, for your holiness. Lord, you are beyond compare, you are wise in everything you do. You are glorious God, you are high and lifted up. Uh, we think briefly of Isaiah's vision and he saw that you were the holy, holy, holy one uh, served by the heavenly beings, your name praised and upheld and honoured. Uh, and Lord help us today as we come to you uh, to join our hearts together in such a way that we might bow before a throne, that we may remember that you are God, King of kings and Lord of lords. Uh, and so, Lord, we come in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we know that we can come in no other way, but we thank you so much that in coming through Christ, we have access uh, to our Father by the Spirit. We thank you, O God, that there is a new and living way uh, opened, uh, that we ordinary folk like us may come to the very presence of God and heaven's throne room 
even today. Uh, and so, Lord, we come and we thank you. And we thank you so much already for what we've heard uh, from your word as it has been read and uh, in just the simple message mainly directed to the children, O oh God. But we thank you so much that uh, the word of salvation is a simple message. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Uh, and, O oh God, we praise you uh, that every one of us here who knows and trusts you uh, is here by your power and your goodness and your love and your faithfulness. Uh, nothing have we brought, Lord. You found us when we were dead in trespasses and sins. You found us when we were blind and you gave us sight that we might see. You found us when we were lost and you rescued us and you brought us home even to your very presence. Uh, and so, Lord, we lift our hearts before you. We thank you for the good things of your word and of fellowship and of heaven and of grace. And we thank you so much that these things also spread to our daily lives and in our homes and in our friendships and our families and our work, our enjoyments. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us so many things to enjoy. And we thank you that you give us lives that under your good hand are fulfilled and blessed and helped. Uh, and Lord, we come to you today and we pray for your gospel being preached, whether that's here or in many other places, O oh God, uh, where the word of Christ is proclaimed, where the Holy Spirit's power is sought. Lord, where truth is declared, we pray, O oh God, that you would act and you would save and you would bless and you would build us up in our faith, that we might be people of God, that we might be holy people, that we might be those, Lord, who are pleasing to you. And so we're conscious that we need to f confess our sin. Uh, Lord, uh, we have senses of failure. Uh, and forgetfulness and Lord we know that there's things that we do and say and think that are against your word against your holy standard mm. but we thank you that the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin mm. and so as we confess we trust and we continue to come by faith and we go on Lord seeking your mercy New each day, Lord. Mercy is new each morning. How much we need that. We pray for that. Lord God, as we gather, we're conscious that uh, some of us, Lord, are finding life a real struggle. Some of us, Lord, know uh, burdens that are hard to share with other folk. Some of us know, Lord, that as the years have gone by, we've been affected by them. And even though we know that you deal with us in grace and kindness. There are still things, Lord, that are big in our lives that perhaps cause us sadness, uh, weakness, uh, a sense, Lord, that things aren't as we would have wanted them to be. And so fill us again, Lord, with a sense that your grace is sufficient for us. Remind us once more uh, that in Christ we are made more than conquerors. Lord, how can this be apart from your wonderful goodness and power for which we thank you? So we pray, Lord, for any today who particularly want to know that you are very close by them. And we pray that they will know that and will know mercy uh, and love and gentleness. Thank you that Christ Jesus is a gentle saviour. Oh, Lord, we thank you so much for that. Lord, please help those today who are serving you in different parts of our land and the world where preaching the gospel is not an easy thing. Oh, Lord, give grace and strength. And give, Lord, good results, we pray, from what is done. We know, Lord, that you say that your word goes out with purpose and it never fails to do what you seek to accomplish. Lord, you are a successful God in that sense, in every way. And so please, we pray, go on doing your kingdom work today through preaching and witness and Christian work, we ask. 
And Lord, for Jim as he preaches here, we pray that the word would be touched with a sense of heavenly blessing for him and for all of us. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Yes, thank you, John. So we'll turn in our, well, we won't turn in our hymn books. We'll turn to the screen <coughs> to 242. Here is love vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. your Bibles open at our reading, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. <coughs> Paul, the Apostle Paul in this passage is addressing those in the church at Corinth who are making the claim that they are wise. And not only were they proud of their worldly wisdom, they were actually using their worldly wisdom to divide the church and to promote personalities. <clears throat> this happens in churches. And Paul is demonstrating to them and to the church down through the ages that with regards to the salvation of souls, worldly wisdom is of no value. Because worldly wisdom cannot save a single soul and cannot build the church. In fact, such wisdom that they are purporting to have does the complete opposite. It causes division. It weakens the church. And even more sinister than that, it actually opposes the doctrine and the fundamentals of the gospel of grace in Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying, to adhere to such worldly, humanistic wisdom is to actually oppose God. It is the antithesis of everything that the gospel of Christ is and stands for. So, from the very outset, Paul was telling them that human wisdom, the wisdom that they are priding themselves having, is an arrogance that will eventually lead to ruin. Whereas, the wisdom of God is based on the new good news of Jesus Christ. It is this gospel, the gospel of Christ and him crucified, that is the only thing that leads to eternal life. So in verse four, uh, 17, Paul tells us categorically, for Christ did not send me to baptise, 
but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. How sobering is that? The great gospel of Jesus Christ, the very power of God unto salvation, made empty. Made of no effect through the pride and the cleverness of man. Turn, turns the worldly way of thinking upside down. The danger was constantly on the mind of the Apostle Paul and, and should be constantly on our minds, especially uh, for, for church leaders. Paul is warning all Christians of all time, do not allow this human wisdom or human eloquence to ever obscure the power of Christ and him crucified. You see, the Christian church must make sure that we are always trusting in the power of the cross because this is the wisdom of God. It's not the worldly wisdom of men. And I say that because the difference is a matter of life and death. In fact, it's a matter of eternal life and eternal death. So, <clears throat> this morning I want to highlight three differences. And, and I want to do this by looking at three significant opposites found in our reading. So, firstly, the wisdom of God's message is the opposite of man's worldly wisdom. Verses 18 to 25. Secondly, the wisdom of God's grace is the opposite of man's worldly pride. Verses 26 to 31. And then thirdly, the wisdom of God's power is the opposite of man's worldly persuasion. Uh, chapter 2, ver the first five verses. So, <clears throat> let's go through them. Firstly, the wisdom of God's message is the opposite of man's worldly wisdom. In all the diversity of the world, there are ultimately only two types of people on this planet. Those in Christ and those not. Simple as that. Those saved and those perishing. Those heading to heaven and those <coughs> heading to hell. Two types of people with entirely opposed positions. And the reason is because ultimately they have two completely different responses to the gospel of Christ. To the good news of Christ and him crucified. Verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness. To those who are perishing. But to us, and I pray that's everyone here this morning, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The demarcation line is clear. Either the message of the cross is foolishness to you, or it is the power of God to save. For those that are perishing, the idea of being saved through the work of a crucified man is utter nonsense. It's utter foolishness. Something their human wisdom just will not accept. I've got <coughs> several old rugby friends of mine who just absolutely laugh me out of the room when I talk to them about this. So if that's your position this morning, then you must know that the wisdom of God and the word of God declares to you, you are perishing. But to those of us who have put our faith and our trust in Jesus, our whole perspective of what wisdom is has now been completely changed. Radically so. The spirit of God has wrought a work in our heart and our mind so that our spiritual eyes now no longer see the cross as foolishness. That was my position years ago. I didn't come from a Christian background. That was my position. I saw the cross as utter foolishness, nonsense. But now, now we, I see the cross as the power of God 
unto salvation. It's the work of the Spirit. Paul is making the point that the wisdom of this world is actually opposed to the only message that can save this world. Verse 19, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and it will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. That is a quotation from Isaiah 29.14. Paul shows that in spiritual matters, God opposes the wisdom of man. So in verse 20, Paul asks these three questions. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? So Paul has shown that in spiritual matters, God opposes the wisdom of man. In fact, God will destroy, ultimately, the wisdom of the wise. Not bow down before it. The point is plain. There is no wise man. There is no scribe, no disputer who can do what Jesus Christ has already done. God has made them all foolish through his wisdom. <clears throat> if you go back in the Old Testament, Pharaoh, go back to Pharaoh and all of Pharaoh's magicians before Moses, they thought they could match the great wisdom of God. Recall the Assyrians and their great arrogance in thinking they could outwit God. And the bottom line is that the world, through wisdom, didn't even know God. There is a constant tendency to think that the, small, the, the smartest uh, and the wisest humans, they're the ones who know most about God. But you see, God can't be found through human wisdom. Only through the message of the cross. The pursuit of human wisdom, yes, it may well bring an earthly contentment. It might bring some happiness. But in of itself, it can never bring saving knowledge of the one true God. In fact... The high learning of mankind has tended, in general, to elevate man and his or her intellect above God. God inevitably leaning to, to no belief in God. And really, only believing in themselves. That's what we're living through today. And of course we see that very much in the theory of evolution, which ultimately tries to do away with God altogether. Worldly human wisdom is always trying to reject or to do away with God. Explain God away. You can listen to it uh, maybe every week. There'll be some program where scientists or, will, will try and explain God away. So Paul asks the rhetorical question. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And of course the answer is yes, he has. God did it in Isaiah's day. He did it in the Apostle Paul's day. God is still doing it today. The, the human wisdom of philosophers, scholars, Judaizers, intellectuals, all of them, all over the world, both in Paul's day and in ours, they cannot understand the wisdom of God. Look where the wisdom of man has brought us currently. I've spoken to people who, who, who refuse to watch the news anymore. They get so depressed by it. All human wisdom put together will never lead mankind to the conclusion that Almighty God would send his only begotten son to die on a cross. Human wisdom won't get you there. 
to not only die on a cross, but to be buried and rise again the third day. And to do all of this, why? To save sinful human beings like you and I. Human wisdom won't have it. I've heard people say, oh, that's just a joke. I've heard other religions say God would never do such a thing. Human wisdom, human religion will not have it. Christ and him crucified is always the stumbling block. God is actually confirming man in his sinful rebellion by choosing something that the wise think is utter foolishness. The Ro as Romans tells us, professing themselves to be wise, they are made fools. As mankind learns more and more on their own, or leans more and more on their own wisdom, the sinful mind of man will never bring itself to the truth of God. Verse 21 tells us why. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. God's wisdom has not Man's wisdom multiplied to the highest degree. It is a wisdom that is entirely different, completely the opposite of man's wisdom. Remember in Isaiah, we read this, Isaiah 55, verses 8 to 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Well, of course, God's thoughts would be higher than ours. Now, I have to be clear here. Paul isn't condemning learning or education here. He is simply saying that by themselves they are inadequate for obtaining spiritual wisdom. T.S. Eliot said in a poem, all our knowledge brings us nearer to our ignorance, and all our ignorance brings us nearer to death. But nearness to death, no nearer to God. Where is the life we have lost in living? That is so telling. For ultimately, that is where the wisdom of man will lead us, to death. Death. It's not that men cannot know about God. Indeed, Romans 1 clearly tells us that we can know God from his creation all around us. But of course, today, what is the wisdom of a man telling us? Ah, but that all came about by chance. In the beginning was nothing. And then it exploded, and here we are. In verse 22, Paul expands this assertion. He says, for Jews request a sign. Greeks seek after wisdom. Now, the Jewish standard of what was wise was to, to be able to see signs of this. And in Paul's day, the Jews were looking for a big sign. They wanted the sign of a miraculous Messiah. A Messiah who would deliver them from these accursed Romans. They wanted an all-conquering Messiah. They were certainly not looking for the message of the cross. Their desire for deliverance was not wrong, of course not. But their rejection of God's way of deliverance was. One commentator put it like this. Their idolatry was that they now had God completely figured out. He would simply repeat the exodus in still greater splendour. And the Greeks, well the Greeks we read seek after wisdom. Now the Greek culture, they valued the pursuit of wisdom. Usually it was expressed in high academic philosophical terms. They certainly did not value the wisdom expressed in this message of the cross. Again, their desire for wisdom. Not bad desire, of course not. 
but their rejection of God's wisdom was. And we come to verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified. Instead of giving the Jews and the Greeks what they demanded in deliverance and wisdom, God gives them something so unexpected, so, so unexpected that it did not fit with their perceived wisdom. It did not fit with their deliverance. A crucified Messiah doesn't fit with any of our wisdom. You see, Christ, Messiah actually meant power, splendour and triumph. Crucified, on the other hand, meant weakness, defeat, humiliation. So preaching Christ crucified was really the ultimate oxymoron. And this was exactly what the Apostle Paul preached. He didn't Judaise the gospel for the Jews... He didn't intellectualise the gospel for the Greeks. I came across this um, <coughs> illustration a little while back. A strong church once inscribed the words, we preach Christ crucified on an archway that led into the churchyard. Over time, two things happened. The church lost its passion for Jesus and his gospel. And ivy began to grow on the archway. The growth of the ivy covering the message showed the spiritual decline. Originally it said strongly, we preach Christ crucified. But as the ivy grew, one could only read, we preach Christ and the church also started preaching Jesus, the great man. Jesus, the moral example, instead of Christ crucified. The ivy kept growing until one could only read, we preach. The church also had now lost Jesus in the message, preaching religious platitude and social graces. Finally, one could only read, we. And the church also became just another social gathering. All about we, not about God. Spurgeon, who <laughs> friends know that I often quote, he put it so well, certain divines tells us that they must adapt truth to the advance of the age, which means they must murder it and fling its dead body to the dogs, which simply means that a popular lie shall take the place of an offensive truth. Jesus and his disciples never, ever diluted the gospel. They never reduced the message to something to suit the wisdom of men. In fact, Jesus presented the gospel as a very stumbling block to them. And this is something the church today needs to do. It needs reminding of. The gospel is a scandal to the Jew. And to the Greek, it is utter foolishness. Verse 25, uh, sorry, verse 24. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. The difference between those rejecting and those accepting the gospel is right there. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. You see, salvation is never the achievement of human wisdom. It is the embrace of God's dramatic and unexpected act at Calvary. Now, I'm not sure that any Christian fully understands such divine love. I know I often wonder, why me? Maybe you think, this, so why, why would God love me? But by the grace of God, we believe it. We believe it. And we believe it because of verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. 
And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Christian, we should never be afraid to admit that we don't understand everything concerning God. Of course we don't. I often say to people, sometimes when people question you about your faith and, and come up with some really good but difficult questions, if you don't know the answer, just say, I don't know. But I'll try and find out for you. Of course we don't know everything about God. How could we know everything about an omniscient, omnipotent, almighty, eternal God? We must not sl slip into what some in the Christian church are trying to do, to, to, as it were, marry Christianity to the world's beliefs or the world's value systems. To do so is actually to exalt man's wisdom over God's. So Paul now goes on to develop his argument in inviting these believers to look at their own experience of what their conversion was. Which brings us to our second significant opposite. The wisdom of God's grace is the opposite of man's worldly pride. Verses 26 to 31. Verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren. Not many wise according to the flesh. Not many mighty. Not many noble are called. Now, that doesn't mean not any noble or any wise people can be saved. History shows us some noble and wise have certainly been saved. Lady Huntington, the rich and influential friend of Whitfield and Wesley, said she was going to heaven by the letter M, highlighting the fact that the verse said not many rather than not any that would be saved. And verses 27 and 28 tells us God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise and so on. Looking at the Corinthians, Paul can say, you're not wise according to the world. You're not mighty. You're not noble. But you're among the foolish things of the world. I wonder if some of those Corinthian Christians were beginning to think of themselves as high and mighty. They were thinking to themselves, oh, look at us. Look at us. Look what God has done in us. Paul is not going to allow that thought. And we mustn't think that way. They've not been chosen because they're great and mighty. They've been chosen because God is great and mighty. We've been chosen, not because of any good in us, but because God chose us. And he's done it to put the shame the wise. This explains part of the pleasure of, of God described in verse 21. God loves to rebuke the idolatry of human wisdom. He often does it by choosing and using the foolish things of the world. Now, of course God has... It's not saying that it's better to be foolish and uneducated. Of course not. Calvin put it this way. In putting the strong and wise and great to shame, God does not exalt the weak and uneducated and worthless, but brings them all, all of them, down to one common level. Whoever we are, whatever our position is in society, we all need salvation. Verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. That's the end result. It's plain. No flesh will ever glory in God's presence. No one will stand before God and declare, oh, I figured you out, God. You did it just like I thought you would. God's ways are greater and higher and nothing of the flesh will glory in his presence. True wisdom belongs only to the believer in Christ Jesus.
righteousness. In verse 30, but of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God, righteousness and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Righteousness means that we are legally declared not only not guilty, but to have a positive God-given righteousness. Isn't that amazing? Sanctification speaks of our behaviour and how the believers are to be separate from the world and separated to God. We don't grow in sanctification by, by as it were, focusing on ourselves, but on Jesus. Because he became sanctification for us. And redemption is a word from the slave trade, actually. The idea is that we have been purchased to an everlasting freedom. We don't, free, we don't find freedom by focusing on ourselves. Jesus became our redeemer. And the purpose of that is all found in verse 31. That, as it is written, he who glorifies, who, sorry, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Third and final opposite. The wisdom of God's power is the opposite of man's worldly persuasion. You see, this all affects the way that we present this message. Paul tells us in the first five verses of chapter 2 that this message is not to be presented according to the world's wisdom. If this message is the opposite of worldly wisdom, well, it must also be the opposite of worldly presentation and persuasion. In other words, you don't present this message the way the world presents its messages. The Corinthians were becoming like those around them. They were presenting the message with man-made logic and uh, arguments and, and, and good quality rhetoric. They were more interested in the presentation than the message. And I have to say, sadly, you can still go to churches today now and find that. They'll present it in such a flash way and you think, wow, who put that together? And the presentation becomes more important than the message. But Paul tells them, and he tells us, in presenting the gospel message, we must focus on the message of Christ, of Christ and him crucified. That's the message. It is the divine mandate that all Christian preachers have been given to preach. It is the gospel of Christ that saves sinful mankind. I cannot point you to any other person. I cannot point you to any other organisation. It is Christ and him crucified. Verse 1 and I of chapter 2, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. He didn't come as a, a celebrity, as a philosopher. He didn't come as an entertainer or a gifted salesman. How did Paul come? He came as a witness declaring the testimony of God. Now in taking this approach, Paul understood he wasn't catering for the audience what the audience wanted. No. He knew what the Jews wanted. They wanted a sign. The Greeks, well, they seek after wisdom. What to do? What to Paul do? He preached Christ and him crucified. Verse 3 shows us that Paul was not brimming with self-confidence. But this kept him from self-reliance and allowed God's strength to flow through him. All preachers should remember that. Paul knew it was the preacher's job to preach but it is the Holy Spirit's job to demonstrate, verse 4, verse 5, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You see, sadly, many churches today are using slick and deceptive means to attract people to the church. 
And they justify it. They justify it by saying, we're drawing them in and then we're winning them to Jesus. But the principle stands. What you draw them with is what you draw them to. Paul preaches the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of man. Paul preached the cross of Christ because it is the most offensive dimension of the gospel. And friends, I say, we should do the same. And we do so, why? Because the cross of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. It's miraculous. It's supernatural. Christ crucified is central in all of its magnitude, in all of its simplicity. It is the most effective dimension of the gospel. Christ and him crucified. Amen. Well, our <coughs> closing hymn at this point of our service is 261. <coughs> there is a green hill far away outside a city wall. to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Saviour who alone is wise be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever Amen